Thank you. So in the amount of time that it took her to introduce me and for me to walk across the stage and find the big red dot, you all completed one of the most complex sensory motor tasks. It involves the very precise orchestration of 32 paired muscles, so that makes 64. Seven motor, seven sensory nerves, and multiple regions of the brain. You did this all in about 800 milliseconds, and you didn't even know you did it. Do you know what that was? You swallowed. This is me, from the inside, swallowing a bit of biscuit. So, <laughs> in this motion picture x-ray, you can see on the right side of the screen, you can probably make out your spine. In the left side of the screen, you can probably see the food in my mouth as I chew it. And then when I'm ready, I send it back through the throat, down through the esophagus, which is a tiny little tube that's up against the spine. I manage to avoid the airway, the passage to the lungs, which is the considerably larger tube on the left side of the screen. The fact that I can do this is testament to the amazing efficiency of swallowing. When you recognize that the only thing separating the tube to the, the stomach and the tube to the lungs is one tiny little piece of tissue about the size of that between your thumb and forefinger. So what happens when it doesn't go so efficiently? Well, a swallowing disorder, or dysphagia is the term, that happens. Now, you may not be an expert at interpreting x-rays, but you can likely see the difference between my swallowing and this one. The bowl is moved, the food moves it very slowly through the throat. It gets stuck. More of it goes down the airway than goes to the stomach. And some of it actually winds up back in the nose. Now, swallowing disorders are a con consequence of a number of different medical conditions across the lifespan. In infants, we have birth injuries and syndromes. In adolescents, kids fall off their skateboards, whack their head, and get a traumatic brain injury. And in adulthood, unfortunately, we have a host of problems, stroke, head and neck cancer, neurodegenerative diseases. Several years ago, with colleagues, I founded the Rose Center for Stroke Recovery and Research. The Rose Center is different from other research centers in that we integrate and mix together specialist clinical care for patients with swallowing impairment with the development of biomedical devices to facilitate rehabilitation and a very active rehabilitation research program. These three things all feed into each other. So very simply put, our job is to fix swallowing when it breaks. So you might ask, can you actually fix swallowing? So that's a really, really good question. Swallowing is a reflex. All of our prior research tells us that's true. And that our general knowledge is you cannot rehabilitate a reflex. But the thinking has been, we may not be able to rehab a reflex, but we can strengthen the muscles that execute the reflex. So historically, all of our approaches to rehabilitation for patients with swallowing impairment have been to strengthen the muscles of the throat, to make them stronger. Now, Maslow says that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I love that quote. So true in swallowing. If we believe that swallowing is a pure reflex that cannot be uh, fixed, and all we can do is strengthen muscles, then by default, we're making an assumption that weakness is the only thing that causes swallowing problems. So, is that true? Are all muscles weak? And indeed, is it true that swallowing is a reflex that we can't rehabilitate? So to answer these questions, 
There are two things that we need to understand that uh, reflect how swallowing is a very unique task. For the first, let's do a little experiment. On the count of three, I want you to raise your right hand. When I say three, <laughs> I can't see you, but I heard you. One, two, three. There you go. And as I said, I can't see you, but I'm guessing that that was not difficult. If you're cooperative and if you have a right hand, you could raise it on the count of three. Now, for the next three minutes, do not raise your hand. Now, I'm not going to wait for three minutes, but that's not going to be difficult for anybody. Hand raising is a purely voluntary behavior. You can or cannot raise your hand on your own whim. So let's try something different. On the count of three, I want you to have a single heartbeat. <laughs> One, two, three. Yeah, not quite the same thing, is it? Now for the next three minutes, no heart beating. Well, fortunately, you won't be able to do that. The heart will do what the heart will do. And your heart is going to keep beating, and it's going to keep you alive. It's not something that you can volitionally stop or control. So, we have, on one end of a spectrum, hand raising, purely voluntary. The other end of the spectrum, heart beating, reflexive. So where do you think swallowing fits in this? So on the count of three, I want you to swallow. One, two, three. Now, I have no idea if you've done that, but my guess is you did, because you can. Swallowing is a behavior that you can do on command, right? So for the next three minutes, no swallowing. What do you think? Can you do it? Now, I will tell you that in about 20 seconds or so, a quarter of you will have swallowed just because it's a highly suggestible task and you're thinking about it. And what else do you do when you think about it? By about 45 seconds, 75% of you will have swallowed or coughed. By the time you get to two minutes, all of you will have swallowed. Swallowing is not something you can entirely control. So, when we look at swallowing, it's a little bit reflexive, like heart beating. It will step up and do its job to protect the airway when it's necessary. But you can also have a lot of capacity to manipulate swallowing. So, you can delay swallowing if you want to savor that last lingering sip of a very fine whiskey. You can drink quickly and repetitively if you have a tall glass of water on a hot summer day. It's this flexibility that allows us to eat a broad range of foods and fluids. We might have a very soft custard or peanut butter on white bread sticky. We might have an overdone steak just off the grill, really chewy, and all the crumbly bits in between. So if we can access the volitional parts of the brain to eat all those different foods, then can we access the volitional parts of the brain to improve swallowing in patients who have had neurological problems? Now, another thing we need to look at, another thing that makes swallowing unique, if we go back to the hand, the very common organization that's very well accepted is that the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, and vice versa. It's a very simple design. But this simplicity is problematic in rehabilitation. If you damage the pathway from here to here, your options for recovery are limited because it's so simple. Now, for swallowing and other tasks that sustain life, it's a very different story. The brain is such a clever, clever thing. For all of those muscles of the head and neck, there's bilateral representation. Both sides of the brain control both sides of the throat, with the exception of a few. And so, if you damage one of those pathways, that's okay. 
hey, there's another three or four pathways. We just have to train the brain to access that new connection. In this regard, it's that redundancy in the neurological system that makes swallowing probably one of the most fixable of the neurological disorders. So, <clears throat> in our patients with swallowing impairment, we have a nervous system that is highly adaptable. So rehabilitation should be easy. So, Mr. Smith, I'd like you to swallow, and I want you to squeeze the muscles at the top of your throat before the ones at the bottom by about 200 milliseconds. Go. Yeah, it's not so easy. We have one very big roadblock with swallowing rehab. You can't see. And how do you fix something you can't see? So my job as a clinical researcher is to develop protocols and technologies that will help our patients see swallowing so that they can manipulate swallowing. We've taken a few hints from our physiotherapy colleagues. This woman does have Parkinson's disease. There she goes. When you watch her try to walk, you can see that she has very, very uh, small and ineffective steps. She has a lot of difficulty transitioning, turning corners, sitting down, standing up. Now her physiotherapist is gonna put some white markers on the rug in front of her. And now using that visual feedback, it's like magic and fairy dust. All of a sudden she has feedback and she can improve her walking remarkably. Now, interestingly, when I look at those feet, I see a tongue. Because in patients with Parkinson's disease and swallowing problems, that was what the tongue does. Very small, inefficient movements. They have difficulty preparing food and then sending it into the throat. So we wanted to see, could we use the visual feed like, back like they've done to improve swallowing? So, <clears throat> we developed a treatment approach at the Rose Center that uses electrodes underneath the chin to measure muscle activity in the muscles that control swallowing. We asked the patients, want you to, you can see a time by amplitude waveform on the screen. At the end of the waveform is a little hamburger, and there's a target that's placed randomly on the screen. So we asked the patients to try to override those small, inefficient movements and replace them with a single swallow that puts the hamburger in the mouth. In doing this, the patients learn to control their motor behavior using the feedback system. In our patients with Parkinson's disease, following two weeks of intensive training, they found they experienced significantly improved oral intake and uh, more functional swallowing. So this was a really good start, but it actually doesn't prove that you can change individual components of a reflex. So we wanted to go another step further. In 2014, our team challenged the current thinking, and we were able to prove for the first time that you could change an individual component of this complicated reflex behavior. So let me explain. <clears throat> I have never admittedly milked a cow, but my understanding would be if you want to milk a cow and get milk, you need to squeeze from the top to the bottom, I'm guessing. Same goes with swallowing. If you want to swallow, you need to squeeze the muscles in the throat from the top to the bottom. If you don't, the food gets stuck in the throat, part of it goes in the airway, a little bit of it might go into the stomach, and some goes up into the nose. So curiously, we've identified a group of patients that do just this. When they swallow, they don't sequence things correctly. And because of that, they're not able to safely eat. They're not weak. They have a problem with motor planning. So strengthening them is gonna do nothing but make them worse. So this is manometry. Now, manometry is a technique where we have two waveforms that measure pressure in the top of the throat and the bottom of the throat. And you can see on the image on your left, the target pattern 
that we get pressure in the top of the throat about 233 milliseconds prior to pressure in the bottom of the throat. You look at the right side of the screen, you can see what these patients do. Those waveforms are stacked right on top of each other. So they're contracting all the muscles at once. And indeed, sometimes they actually swallow backwards where they push the food up. So we use this technique in an intensive rehab program where we place the catheter through the nose. We ask the patient to watch those waveforms. While he's watching the waveforms, we say, try to make the blue line come first. And usually they say, you want me to what? How do I do that? And we say, don't know. Watch the lines. Try to make the blue line come first. And through trial and error and a whole lot of practice, they learn to make the blue line come first. And in doing that, as they change the lines on the screen, they change their motor behavior and are able to swallow more efficiently. In our lab, out of uh, 12 patients who presented with this problem, 11 of them returned to oral feeding after they hadn't eaten for, in some time, in some cases, quite a few years. They were able to restore oral feeding and return to a normal diet. Now, we can do this as well with more sophisticated equipment. What you saw before was three channels of manometry. This is 36. This is manometry on steroids. There's so much information in the waveforms that it displays that information as a color plot. So they see this picture on the screen. This is a normal swallower. The blue colors are low pressure. The warm colors are high pressure. And you can see where there's a gap that allows the food to go through from the throat to the esophagus. So we do the same thing with this technique. As before, we place the catheter. The patient then watches the colors on the screen. As they learn to manipulate the colors on the screen, they're consequently learning to manipulate the muscles in their throat to swallow more efficiently and more safely. So can we rehabilitate a reflex? Well, I would say, yes, indeed, we can. Research in our laboratory has proven not only that not all swallowing is due to weakness, but that we can take very singular, independent components of a very complicated swallowing response, and using visual feedback, patients can learn to manipulate very, very tiny movements in their throat. In this age of technology, the very best gadget definitely is the human brain. And of all the years of working in this area, I am always astonished by how the brain can manipulate and modulate and change. But nothing says we can't help it out every now and then with a little bit of technology. Thank you very much. Thank you.